in your bulletin. You can grab one on the way out. Now today, we're continuing uh, a series on the miracles of Jesus, very specific miracles of Jesus. These are miracles that took place on the Sea of Galilee. Most of Jesus' ministry was in the Galilee, but a lot of healings and different things took place in cities like Nazareth, like Capernaum, different places like that. But these miracles that we want to deal with, Sea of Miracles, take place on the Sea of Galilee. So we've looked at some of these different ones, and today we're going to be in Luke chapter 8. This morning I want to talk to you about calm. Last week we talked about catch. This morning, this morning is calm. Luke chapter 8 and verse 22. This miracle is recorded in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So we're going to read Luke to start, but then we're going to turn over to Matthew and spend the, uh, the, the rest of the time, or excuse me, in Mark. We're going to spend the rest of the time in the Gospel of Mark, the description of the miracle there. But let's look at it. Luke chapter 8 and verse 22. Now it happened on a certain day that Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake or the Sea of Galilee. And they launched out. And as they sailed, Jesus fell asleep and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to Jesus and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. But Jesus said to them, where is your faith? Let's pray. Lord, we ask in the next few moments that you will speak to us. We want to hear from you all that you have for each of us. God, just let your Holy Spirit move in this place. You have spoken to us through praise and worship. Continue to speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I currently serve as the president of Global Servants, which is a nonprofit missions organization. But for years and years and years, I, I worked there as the, in addition to other stuff that I did, I was the international director of West Africa. So I would travel to West Africa once and sometimes twice a year. At the time, we were living in Lakeland, Florida, which is central Florida. So I would fly out of Tampa. But also at the time, there wasn't a direct flight to Accra, Ghana from the America. So you had to fly to Europe and then down to Accra. Now you can fly out of New York, but back then you couldn't. Well, there also weren't any direct flights on the carriers that I needed out of Tampa. So I went from Tampa to Miami, Miami to somewhere, London or Amsterdam, and then down to Accra. So I had to do this often. And it's a lot of flights and a lot of little, you know, up, down, up there, there, you know, to get to where you're going. All that to say, we were flying into Miami one time. And people will tell you that Florida is the sunshine state, but it is not. Do not be fooled. Florida is the afternoon rain state. Anybody that's lived in Florida knows about 2 p.m. to about 5 p.m. it rains. It doesn't matter where you live in Florida, it rains. The rain comes in off of the the Atlantic Ocean. Two to five, you're always going to get rain. So I would travel to Africa mostly in the summer. We're flying into Miami. The pilot came on and said, hey, I need everybody to return their seats. We're going to suspend cabin service. We're flying into Miami. We're going to be going through some some thunderstorms. Please fasten your seatbelts and uh, remain seated. I've flown a lot, hundreds, maybe thousands of times. I've flown all over, literally all over the world. Those announcements come on all the time. This time, he was serious. About two minutes after that announcement happened, I'm telling you, we must have dropped a five, six hundred, a thousand feet in like 30 seconds. Have you ever been on a plane where that's happened and the bottom just drops out? Go, you just oh, what's and you, like that, right? And then it just kept, oh. and I started. Have you ever, when you're about to get sick, you start sweating? I started sweating on this plane. I could hear other people around me throwing up, and I was like, oh God, please don't let me throw up on there. I've never thrown up before, but it would just continue. This, it was awful. At about 30 seconds before we landed, I thought to myself, if we don't get on the ground in like a minute, I'm going to throw up. And I reached over and grabbed the bag out of the seat pocket in front of me. And the guy next to me was like, you know, and he was more nervous. <laughs> yeah, he was worried. Am I going to throw up on him? Am I going to get it all in the bag? I mean, so it was awful. It was awful. I was reminded of that this week because there is something about a storm when you're in your house. There is something about a storm 
that isn't quite as intimidating. We lived in Oklahoma. They used to do tornado warnings every Saturday at noon. The tornado sirens go off in big cities in Oklahoma every Saturday to test the tornado sirens. So when you're in your house and a storm's coming, you can go into an interior bathroom. You can get in a, the room under the stairs. You can go in the basement. In Oklahoma, they had tornado shelters. You can get in your storm cellar. All these things happen. But when you're in a means of conveyance, when you're in a mode of transportation, your safety is limited to the vehicle itself. I would much rather be in my house than be in a plane or a boat or a car or any of the rest of those things. So I want you to understand what's happening. These guys are professional fishermen. They're out on this boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and a horrible storm happens. Now, we read it. Jesus calms the storm, but just like last week, the miracle of the great catch of fish that we talked about last week, that miracle wasn't really the point. The point was how Jesus speaks to us. The same way, Jesus calming the storm really isn't the point in all of this. The point of this is how do we respond to the storms of life? I'm not talking about physical storms where you find yourself in a boat in a storm. I'm talking about the storms of life, the things that swirl around us. How do we respond to the storms? And this miracle of Jesus calming the storms gives us this template. So turn back, if you will, to Mark chapter 4. We want to read the same incident recorded slightly differently in Mark. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On the same day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with Jesus. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Now, here's the thing. These guys are professional fishermen. They do this for a living. They have spent their entire lives on the Sea of Galilee. They grew up in Capernaum, which is on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. For James and John, we know for a fact that their father was a professional fisherman as well. Zebedee was a fisherman. They're fishermen. They've seen storms before. However, what happened in this moment was they got totally and completely obsessed with the storm. As we navigate through life, as we move through life, the first thing that we have to remember is do not focus on the storm. Do not focus on the storm because when you are totally and completely obsessed with the storm, the storm looks bigger and stronger and more powerful than probably it really is. It's, it's an optical illusion. The devil loves to use storms to intimidate you into thinking that the storm is more powerful than the God who created the universe. See, you see what we do? We get our eyes on the storm. Look how tall the waves are. Look how strong the wind is. But pay attention to something. Go back to Mark 36. And they took Jesus along in the boat. They were focused on the storm. And Jesus was in the boat with them. But they were focused on the storm. The storm is always going to be bigger and more intimidating probably than it actually is. As many of you know, we lived in Toccoa, Georgia for a couple of years. I pastored there. The, the, the county that it's in is Stevens County. And like many of those um, less populated northern Georgia counties, there's just one high school for the county, Stevens County High School. So uh, when we moved there, both of the boys went to Stevens County Middle School. And then while we were still there, Mark did his freshman year of high school at Stevens County High School. In Mark's grade was a young man named Ben Cleveland. I don't know how many of you know or follow. I assume you do, but I don't know how closely you follow UGA football. Ben Cleveland is an amazing football talent. He played for the University of Georgia. His last year in college, he was a a first-team All-SEC. He was a third-team All-American. After he graduated from UGA, he played offensive line. He played offensive guard. After he graduated from UGA, he was drafted by the Baltimore Ravens. And Ben Cleveland plays football for the Baltimore Ravens right now to this day. And he was friends with Mark. They played ball together, all of those things. In eighth grade, Mark was on the basketball team. Mark loved basketball, played basketball, and Ben played basketball his eighth grade year. In eighth grade, Ben Cleveland, it was as big as he is now playing professional football. 
in the eighth grade, he was six foot six, he weighed about 330 pounds, and he had a beard. <laughs> he looked like a dad playing with his kids. He was enormous. And one of my favorite things in the world was when we played a home game and the, the, the other team would be out on the court warming up and Stevens County would run in and Ben would run in last and you could see all the color drain out of the other team's face. They're in eighth grade. They're all like 5'10". He's 6'6 and weighs 330 pounds. He's enormous. And they could just watch him. We're going to get killed. That guy's going to eat me before the game's over. Here's the only thing, though. Ben is a world-class athlete in football. Basketball is like not his sport. When I say not his sport, I mean not even a little bit. I saw Ben get six, seven, eight rebounds in a row and miss the layup and just keep getting his own shot. The other kids on the other team are just bouncing off of him like, the, like, like toddlers attacking their father. And he's just continuing to throw the ball up, miss, 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 over and over and over again. He didn't really help Stevens County Middle School win any basketball games. But when they walked in... Everybody on the other team was intimidated by how huge and how big he was in his presence and how he looked so scary. Listen to me. That's how storms work in our life. The point of the storm is to intimidate you into focusing on it instead of focusing on Jesus who's in your boat. Jesus is in your boat. He's on your side. He's in your corner. He supports you. He loves you. He's on your side. He's working for you. He wants to bless you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to do all this stuff for you. But we have no time for Jesus because look at that storm. Look how big the waves are. Look how strong the wind is. Oh, the water's coming in the boat. Don't focus on the storm. Don't get obsessed with the storm. Don't focus solely on the storm. We see the waves. We see the wind. But he is the maker of the wind. He is the maker of the waves. He is the creator of the universe. The point of the storm almost every time. Are storms scary? Yes. Do they hurt us? Yes. I'm not pretending like storms aren't real. Everybody in here, interestingly enough, I talked to several people on the way in and I thought to myself or told them, this sermon's going to be for you today. Everybody in here is dealing with some kind of a storm that's happening in our life. I'm not saying that the storms aren't painful, that the storms aren't difficult. But remember this, our God is so much bigger than the storms. Our God is so much greater than the storm. He is so much more magnificent and majestic than the storms. We look at the wind and we say, what can ever happen? I'm doomed. I'm going to be destroyed. This boat's going to sink. Jesus is in the boat. Don't focus on the storm. Look to Jesus. Now, continue with this. Go back to Mark chapter 4. Now look at verse 38. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke Jesus and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? This is a fascinating little verse. I love this verse. Jesus is in the boat with them. Peter and James and John and Andrew, they're pulling at the ropes. They're letting the sail down. The boat's spinning. The waves are crashing. They're like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Andrew says, Peter, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? And he looks over at Jesus. And Jesus got a neck pillow on and, and eye shades. <laughs> he's just sleeping. I love that Mark records. He's not only asleep, he's asleep with a pillow. <laughs> I love that. And Peter's like, are you kidding me? And he, you know, he's just sleeping. And they're pulling on the side. Well, they're about to drown. What's the difference? Jesus is not in a different boat. Jesus is in the same boat, in the middle of the same storm, in the middle of the same lake. Everything about his circumstances are identical to all of the guys that are in the boat with him. So why is Jesus asleep and everybody else is freaking out? Now you could say, well, it's because he's Jesus. He's like the son of God. That may have something to do with it. But I would like to propose that it's actually a deeper thing that is, a, that is available for all of us. And it is this. Jesus is asleep. He can find peace because Jesus trusted in the Father. Yeah. 
Jesus is peaceful. He's not afraid. He's not intimidated. He's not focused solely on the storm because Jesus has this deep, authentic, intimate relationship and connection to the Father. And again, you say, well, of course he had connection to God the Father. He is, he is God the Son. But, it's, but Jesus gives us a template in his earthly life and ministry. He gives us that template. He is constantly withdrawing from the crowd and going to pray. He spends time alone with the Father. He withdraws from the crowd. He goes to the wilderness. He goes to a lonely place. He goes to the desert over and over and over and over again. He is giving us a template. You want to survive the storms of life. You need to be in direct connection with the Father, because direct connection with the Father will give you peace. Jesus is asleep in the boat. Everybody else is freaking out. We're about to drown. Teacher, don't you care that we're dying? We're dying here. And Jesus is sleeping. He's peaceful because he has that connection. Those of you with kids know this. How many of you with kids have ever woken up in the middle of the night and feel like there's something in the room? And you open your eyes, and your child is about half an inch from your face, like this with their eyes wide open. And you're like, yeah! What the? Right? I think oh, they do it. I, I used to get so furious with them, they quit coming to my side of the bed. You know, the kids, the kids know which side the parent sleeps on, and they always go to Courtney's side, because they knew I would, because they would wake me up. Dad, ah, what, what? I can't sleep. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but here's the thing. I used to do it to my parents. You reap what you sow, more than you sow, later than you sow. I used to do it to my parents. I'd go in my mom's room. I'd never wake her up. I'd never touch her. I didn't want them to be mad at me if I woke or shook them awake. But you know, you'd have something happen. You'd have a bad dream. You'd hear something outside your window. You'd hear something underneath your bed. And I'd go in my mom's room and I'd get about a half an inch from her face, an inch from her face, and I'd just stare at her and try to telepathically wake her up. <laughs> like that, mom, mom, mom. I mean, that's her name. I'm calling her mom, 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 mom. But I wouldn't say it. I would be thinking it. <laughs> like that, right? And just force her to wake up through sheer willpower. I'd just force her to wake up. <laughs> Sometimes she wouldn't wake up. If she wouldn't, I'd go get my pillow and my blanket, and I'd just go in their room and sleep at the foot of their bed. I'd just sleep on the floor at the foot of their bed. Why? Because just being with the Father, being with your parents, makes you feel safe. It gives you peace. The bad dream, if I could just get in the bed with them, not on the outside, that's where the monsters will get you. You gotta get on the inside, between. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, between both parents. If I can just get on the inside, you got to crawl over mom because my dad would murder you if you woke him up in the middle. <laughs> so you got to crawl over mom. If you can get in the middle there, buddy, there is no safer place in the world when you're a kid than sleeping right in between those two parents. Nothing's going to get you. Why could Jesus sleep in the boat? He could sleep in the boat because he was connected to the Father. And connection to the Father gives you peace no matter the circumstances, no matter the storms that swirl around us, no matter the wind, no matter the rain, no matter the waves, it doesn't matter because you are connected deeply, authentically, intimately with the Father. This really doesn't have anything to do with who Jesus was as the Son of God, fully man and fully God. He gives us the template. They ask him how to pray, and he says, you pray, our Father. Do you see that? We have the same connection and intimacy. We have the ability to have that same level of peace that Jesus had in that boat. But that doesn't come through anything other than connection to the Father. We are connected to the Father, and we can find the same level of peace in the boat that Jesus found. He was not focused on the storm, and therefore he wasn't afraid and freaking out because he trusted in the Father. And because he trusted in the Father, he could find peace in the storm. Now, back to the story. Look at verse 39. It says, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? 39. Then Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the sea, when the wind ceased, there was a great calm. And Jesus said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? All right. 
Now, this is the part of the miracle that we struggle with, right? Because we say to ourselves, well, Jesus could sleep in the boat because he knew that he could calm the storm. That's how we're not Jesus. I'm not, I can't calm the storm. So you say there's, there's, of course he could sleep. Of course he was peaceful, but his peace had nothing to do with his power. His peace had everything to do with his relationship with the father. In the same way with this, this is not really about Jesus calming the storm. It is about what he says after. He says, why are you so afraid? Why are you so fearful? Why don't you have faith? The final thing is this. We respond with faith in the Father. We respond with faith in the Father. And having faith in the Father allows us to trust that he will do what he's going to do with the storm. We, we, what happens is we get frustrated with miracles like this because we focus on the miracle instead of what Jesus is teaching us. I, I, I've seen this. For those of you who are my age, maybe a little bit younger, a little bit older, you remember this. It ha- came around when I was probably <clears throat> late high school or, or college age, early, you know, 20s, things like that. It was everywhere, especially in Christian youth groups. The slogan was everywhere, right? WWJD. It was everywhere. What would Jesus do? Every shirts, bracelets, bandana, every hats, WWJD. It frustrated me as a teenager. Because here's what I said to myself. Yes, I, WWJD, trying to remind you to be kind, to be loving, to do what Jesus did, help people, things like that. But the problem was so much of what Jesus did, I cannot possibly replicate stuff like walking on water and raising the dead and calming the ocean. So WWJD didn't feel encouraging to me. It felt like condemnation. I can't be like, how could I do, what would Jesus do? Well, I know what Jesus would do. He would raise the dead. I need another option here. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know what Jesus, what would Jesus do? I know what he would do. That's not available to me. But here's the thing. It is. It is. What would Jesus do? What Jesus would do is what he told us. Have faith. Why are you fearful? Why are you afraid? Have faith. Why don't you have faith? And so the question then becomes, well, why didn't they? Why didn't they have faith? And that's something that we struggle with 2,000 years later. But Jesus, through his life and ministry, has resolved that problem for us. I understand how it was difficult for Peter and James and John in that boat to have the faith that they needed to have. But 2,000 years later, it's been resolved for us. I want to show you two sets of verses. First, look at 1 Timothy. This is... Paul's letter to his son in the faith, Timothy. 1 Timothy 2 and 5. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Paul says, There is one God and one mediator between God and men, or humanity. The mediator is the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all. So he says there is one person making intercession. Sinful, fallen humanity is over here. The holiness of God is over here. How can those two things connect? They connect through one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. One mediator, one intercessor making intercession for us so that we have access to the holy God, to a holy God. We have access, which means what? We can have faith in the storm. Because Jesus is working for us on our behalf, talking to God the Father. So we can have faith. Why are you afraid? Have faith. We can have faith because of Jesus. Let me show you one more. Hebrews chapter 4. I love these verses. You've heard me talk about them before. Hebrews 4 and 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. So he says, we have a great high priest who is Jesus. 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need or in time of storms. 
When you're going through a storm, you can come boldly before the throne of grace, not because of anything you've done, not because you're holy, you're full of sin, you're full of problems, you're full of issues, you've caused pain, all of this stuff, we have all these issues, so we come boldly before the throne because of Jesus, and because of Jesus, we obtain help in times of storms, of need, of problems. We can have faith because of what Jesus has done for us. That is the wonderful essence of the calming of the storm. It's not really Jesus calming the storm. It is that he is showing us that in every moment, in seasons of problems, of pain, of storms, no matter what we're dealing with, we can come boldly before the throne. We can obtain grace and mercy and help not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. So, let me close this a little bit differently. The whole, there's a whole cottage industry in America that is made up of trying to help people find levels of peace. You can start a little rock garden in your backyard, right? You can practice Zen, yoga. You've seen these guys with little um, sand on their desk and a little rake, and you can make you know, images, symbols in the sand, help you relax. You can buy a stress ball at any Dollar General. You ever been dealing with your kids and you're like, <laughs> that ball just saved your life. You know what I'm saying? You're like, Wear out some stress balls. There's a whole cottage, there's a whole industry built up around finding peace. Because we live these levels of crazy stress. We live these high levels of anxiety, of worry, of concern over the storm, of concern over, and everybody's storm is different. Everybody walked in here with a storm. And I'm just going to tell you. There's no sand rake, and there's no rock garden, and there's no stress ball that's really going to deal with that stuff. Everybody came in here with a storm. Where we find peace is remembering that the storm is not as big as Jesus is. And Jesus is already in the boat. All we have to do is trust him. Have faith and he will bring the solution. We can't make the storm stop. We can't rebuke it. What we can do is access Jesus, our one mediator, our intercessor. We access Jesus and through him, the throne of grace, which will give us help in our time of need. So what we're going to do here at the end is not an altar call. It is a moment of calm. It's just a moment of peace. If you want to come to the altar, you can. If you want to sit out there, you can. If you want to stand, great. If you want to walk around, fantastic. Whatever you want to do. But this is your moment of calm. We are going to sing It Is Well by Bethel Music. There's a great line in this. The waves and the wind still know his name. The waves and wind still know his name. I want you to hold on to that. Like I said, I know some of you dealing with storms. I'm not saying they're not scary. I'm not saying they're not frustrating. I'm not saying they're not intimidating. I'm not saying any of that. I'm not negating the storm that is roiling around you. What I'm saying is we serve a God who made the universe. And we can boldly, boldly, not because of anything we've done. We boldly approach the throne of grace because of who Jesus is. And we approach the throne and find help in our time of need. We find calm in our storm. We find calm in our storm. Not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is. 
Don't focus on the storm. Trust in Jesus. Have faith in God. This is your moment of calm. This is your moment of peace. You respond however you want. But I want you in this moment to focus on God and let him speak to you about that storm. What he's going to say is peace and calm. Give him the storm this morning. Let him speak peace into your storm. Let's pray. Lord, I ask right now, every person would receive your peace. As we sing this wonderful song and as we focus on you, we receive your peace for our storm. Every person with a unique storm that rages around them. Every person with the wind blowing and the waves threatening to sink the boat. And yet we turn our eyes to you. You are larger than the storm. And you speak peace and calm. We are no longer bound by fear. We have faith. And we can come boldly before the throne and obtain the help that we need. Right now, God, speak peace. Speak calm to these storms. We worship you. The waves and the wind, they still know your name. Amen.